everyone, uh, and welcome to the panel, uh, The Power of the Narrative Podcast. Uh, today, tonight, this evening, no matter the time zone that you're in, we are joined by Jana Bianc, Jean-Paul Garnier, and Marguerite Kenner, who all have some great insight into making narrative podcasts. First, I would like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, the narrative podcast they work on, and what inspired them to create narrative podcasts. And if it's all right with y'all, we can go in the order of just randomly Jana, Jean-Paul, and Marguerite, if that's all right. Yeah. Works for me. Great. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Fight of Laundry. Uh, I'm Jana Bianchi. I'm a writer, uh, editor, podcaster, and translator from Brazil. Uh, and I feel like I'm the baby in this panel because I have like uh, two, uh, I, my main podcast is a nonfiction podcast about writing that's called Curta Ficção. All my projects are in Portuguese for Brazilian audiences. And uh, so this is my main podcast, but I have two other podcasts that are storytelling related. Um, the first one is called Asso View, and it's a... Uh, Audio uh, is an audio narration of the uh, flash fictions that I published in my one one part of my magazine that's called Faisca. So we have a newsletter with two stories, and every week we have two stories sent by mail, and then uh, they are narrated and uh, dramatized. It's not I'm not the host or the narrator, so it's Ariel Iris who will take care of that. But I'm the organizer of the main project. And I also have a project that's called uh, Vozes da Galeria, and it's a project related to my own uh, book, because it's like my book is a uh, urban fantasy set in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, and it's a storytelling podcast with a clandestine um, radio, uh, like an underground radio, supernatural things happening and things like that. Yeah. But it's like uh, it's it's like a personal project. Is the it's just for having fun and experimenting with audio, and yes, and that's it. And I I love like both projects, uh, like Jean Paul and Marguerite projects, and I am like feeling that I will learn a lot in this panel. So <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jean-Paul Garnier. I'm the producer and engineer and editor for the Simultaneous Times podcast, which is a monthly speculative fiction podcast. Uh, I also am the owner of Space Cowboy Bookstore in Joshua Tree, California, out here in the Mojave. And uh, I am the current editor of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association's Starline magazine. Um, I came to podcast by way of radio. I grew up listening to radio dramas. And later in life, I became an audio engineer, and I just wanted to marry two of my passions and find ways to bring science fiction stories to life for a global audience. Fantastic. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I'm Marguerite Kenner. I'm the co-owner of Escape Artists. So we publish Escape Pod, Podcastle, Pseudopod, Cast of Wonders, and Cat's Cast, because we love podcasts so much, we now have one about cats. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. The, the ones that are relevant here, I've just come from a panel about contracts because I'm a lawyer by day. Um, but the hats that I wear for this panel that are most relevant is one, I'm a short audio fiction publisher. And two, I'm also a voice actor. I've been in a bunch of different audio dramas, including the Magnus Archives, the Secret of St. Kilda, and the one that I have coming up is called Super Suits, which is about superhero powered lawyers. Gee, I wonder why that was interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I I like to be on all sides of the microphone. Um, Escape Artists also released their very first audio drama um, this last Halloween called Witching Hour, which is was a full original audio drama. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introductions. I have many things I need to look into later then. Um, so the first question that I have for y'all is, a lighthearted one. What do you guys love about narrative storytelling from a listener or a creator perspective? And what are some examples you might have? And we can go in the same order or whoever wants to answer first. I think I 
can go in the same order. <laughs> um, I don't mind. Okay, so the main thing that I love about uh, narrative podcasts is that, yes, I think this is like the, the cliche, but it's that you are immediately immersed in the story. You don't, of course, uh, when we read, we create things in your head, but when we have audio, it's a very powerful tool to set the mood, to introduce, you know, to uh, even to build characters. You have an accent, a way of talking. Um, you have noises in the background, you can, you know, think about the setting in your head. So this is something that I like because um, I also like to have some time just to read something like calmly, but I sometimes I like to be, you know, removed from my reality. And, uh, but I also want to keep the, the power to imagine things as I wish that you don't we don't have it when you are watching something we have like uh some some sometimes i don't know i want to imagine a character that looks like me as an example uh but so i have the voice i have all these immersive things but i don't have the image there to lead you know my imagination so what i like in audio is that that it can keep this factor of creating things of filling blank spaces with things that are in my head but I have more than just what's written, just the words. I have like more things to help me build. So I think it's kind of a midterm between like reading and watching something, uh, not only because we have one less sense, but because we have this space to feel with what we want. So this is what I like the most. And I think it's amazing. For me, I think my favorite part is when I'm choosing stories for the podcast um, and ultimately narrating them often, um, I end up reading a story a dozen, 15 times before, before we get into production and during the production. And I find that I start to understand the stories on a much deeper level. There's often my favorite stories the first time I read them. Um, I don't get as much out. I haven't fully understood what the author's intentions are. And the more and more I read the story, oftentimes the story gets better and better. And I feel that my job is as an interpreter um, to hopefully deliver the author's message as they intended it. And um, to read really deeply into a short story has been very rewarding for me. Uh, as a listener to podcast, I, I really love audio fiction because um, I'm in, I'm an audio oriented person. Uh, I'm not a very visual person. I'm aphantasic, which means I don't really see images in my mind. And so it's easier for me to connect with fiction um, through audio. And what we try and do at simultaneous times is essentially we produce like a film, but there are no visuals. Um, so we try to have all of the cues for the story in, in audio format. And I find that very rewarding um, as someone who doesn't relate as much to visual information. I, I'm really glad that you said that, John Paul, because one of the things that's really that I really like about audio fiction in general, both as a listener and as a creator, is the dimension of accessibility that it has. Uh, I think on this panel, we're going to use the word listen a lot. And I think it's important to plant a flag on the fact that when we're talking, especially about audio fiction, people don't just listen to it. Uh, people read it, people engage with it, they create off of it. Um, podcasts have always been associated with audio because it's the medium that's, you know, they're distributed and things like that. But they're not just audio, they're very multi dimensional, and that there's usually more than just a component picked up by one particular sense. And it's, it's, it's like what um, Jana was talking about how it's, you know, it's multi dimensional, that there are different ways of, I mean, there, there are strengths presenting different types of information in different forms. Some things that work on prose. You can't do House of Leaves in audio. I'd love to see somebody try. Good luck. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just not going to translate because that is a text that relies on the physical placement of text on a piece of paper in order to tell part of its story. But at the same time, that we all know as, you know, rabid fans of audio fiction and audio drama, that there are ways that those stories are told that just would not be the same as engaging with the script of them simply in prose form. So I, I really love the multidimensionality and the fact that it it become it takes prose and makes it accessible to people who have 
visual processing difficulties or, or, you know, by making text available, we make rich audio experiences available to people who have audio processing difficulties. A very common compliment that we get at EA, and I don't say this to brag, but I say it because it, it, it speaks to this and it's my favorite thing that we receive is we get messages from people who are not native English speakers who are learning English and who use our stories because we have the audio and we have the text because it gives a more rich learning experience. It's not just, I'm going to try and teach myself how to pronounce this word off the page, but I'm hearing somebody say it, or I'm hearing lots of people say the same word different ways or in different inflections. So there's that level of accessibility to audio fiction that I think isn't as rich of an experience on, on in just prose. Um, the other thing I love about audio fiction, probably the reason why horror tends to be the most represented genre when we talk about audio is exactly as Jean said, it's that intimacy. You know, when you go to a horror movie and you, and you look at it like this, sometimes, you know, you don't do that with your ears. That's one of the, it's one of the flaws when we're talking about engagement and pro style, or one of the difficulties and the challenges when talking about engagement and pro style is that studies show that people do not skip the boring parts of audio. You know, we've all read a really big book where there's like a four page dinner scene or, or a song or, you know, something where like, eh, okay, stop. you don't do that in audio. Um, People, either, because you don't, there that intimacy. And I don't know if it's the physical connection, if it's the fact that there's a different way that it's processed, but it goes straight into your brain in a different sort of way where you don't skip quiet parts. People who listen to audio either listen to it all the way through, or when they get bored, they stop. They don't skip ahead. They just, they just disengage. And, um, that leads to very, like I said, very different types of narrative styles that lend its strengths to an audio presentation of a text. Love it all so much. And that also leads to the next question, um, kind of going in deeper into that as well. Uh, what makes narrative podcasts and audio podcasts um, different and unique from other storytelling mediums. And how do y'all take advantage of these strengths and differences uh, to enhance the podcast? Do we keep the same order? I will tell you that. Sorry? Do we, we keep the same order? I can oh, answer. Okay. If, if you want. It's okay. <laughs> The first thing that uh, before answer the question, I want to say, like, as a non native English speaker, it's really important what you said, Margaret, because it's like it helps a lot. But not only when we have the written piece, just to hear things, it helps a lot. Like, because you're doing something you like and you're, you know, engaging with the language. So when I used to work like uh, in a company many years before, uh, many years ago, I used to go like all the way in the bus, in the packed bus, you know, and I couldn't see it to read something, I couldn't do it. And I would like be listening to a, to a, an audio book in English and it's like helps, um, it helped me a lot to, you know, the, the, the transporting time I was like learning, like improving my English, whatever. And I was like having fun, you know, reading a story. So it's, it's very What nice. did we do on commutes before podcasts? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and now, and now, and now larger chunks of us don't commute anymore and yet even though we don't commute anymore podcast listening is still going up it's not going down yeah it, it means something because you always need to you know do the yard dishes and <laughs> things like that so you always need some treadmill background <laughs> um okay but about the question uh the things that make the narrative podcast unique right i think this is like i like this component of interpretation uh, that goes into a podcast because I think it's like, um, I don't know, I think it's, we, it, it's impossible to read something in a neutral way, in a neutral way, right? You, you always have some kind of interpretation in a way of another. 
But I think that sometimes, sometimes it can be, you want to have something like as neutral as possible to read, but sometimes it's nice to have somebody leading you. I think it's, it's nice to have some, somebody, um, maybe, I don't know, helping you to, as I said, like set the mood. So if you were reading by yourself, maybe if you're not, if you don't know what the story is about beforehand, you don't know, you can, you don't know, you can like read a whole chapter of something in a, in a uh, mood that's not the right one. So maybe you have, when you arrive in the second chapter, you're like, ooh, this is not what I was expecting. And you can have some, not the ideal way of like the ideal experience. So I think this is pretty interesting because I think you can, uh, if you are producing some things for, to be uh, published in audio, I think you can take advantage of that because you can, uh, as an example, not describing something because you know that you will be, you know, giving other cues to people to understand that uh, without needing to explain. If you're writing to be read, like you need to explain something, you need to set something like before so people know what to expect. So I think this is nice because you can produce another product, you know, entire new product by knowing uh, if you know very well how to use these strengths, you can um, change the way you write. Although it's, it, it would, maybe it would work as a written piece too, but you can, you know, have these small differences and make things um, not only shorter, but I think more objective and more, I don't know, I think more precise maybe. And I think it's just very interesting. I think that one of the reasons we all love narrative fiction so much, audio fiction, is because um, all forms of literature spur from the oral tradition of storytelling. And human beings are addicted to listening to each other tell stories. We love to tell stories. We love to spin the yarn, um, you know, truth enhancement, where you make a story better as you go by embellishing a little bit. Um, and, and I think that we all connect with that um, because it, it's something intrinsic to, to the birth of culture, really. Um, one of my favorite, there, there's a couple favorite things I have about doing this. Um, as Marguerite said, that some of the stories, uh, not everything works in audio format. I've had to turn down some brilliant stories because there are things that will just be lost in the translation to audio, um, which is a shame. But that being said, uh, there's things you can do in audio that wouldn't work on the page. Uh, one of the things that we love to do, and I hope to do more of these, is occasionally we'll do a fake commercial uh, to throw something in, or we've, we've had stories that are specifically written for um, to be spoken out loud. And that gets really, really fun because if you read it in a book, it wouldn't make sense or it just wouldn't work. So we have available to us um, uh, devices that you just can't normally do as a writer. If anything, it's more like writing a script. Um, you know, sometimes we just read the story straight and and that's a lot of fun too, but sometimes there are things unique to the audio format um, that, that can be quite exciting. And I, I find that it can also be quite surprising when you encounter them listening to a podcast and, and that's always, uh, those delightful surprises, you know, we, we try to add those and I'm always looking for that. Um, I have to say, though, hands down, my favorite thing about doing this and creative narrative podcast is when an author gets the chance for the first time to hear how we have adapted their piece. And oftentimes authors will say things like um, they noticed things in the stories that, that they didn't know were there or weren't prevalent. And um, because it's a form of interpretation that can be really exciting to almost collaborate with the authors and to present their stories to them in a new way um, and get emotions out of it that they might not have realized were the strengths of the story. Um, so working with the authors directly is, is an absolute joy. And every time we work with a new author that's never, never had one of our productions done for their piece, um, you know, there's always that nerve wracking moment. Oh my gosh, will they like what we've done? Um, but to have the story come alive in a new way for the author and hopefully for the audience as well uh, is the real greatest joy of doing this. I love that. You know, we talk about movies and that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a sound is worth at least a hundred, you know, and, and audio gives us a second dimension from prose. 
And it, it also does really interesting things with like authorial intent, right? Because I, I love, Donna, what you said about how nobody reads from neutrality. Everybody, you know, has something that they're bringing with it. And we've all probably had one of those experiences where that perhaps clashed with what the author was trying to convey with the presentation of the prose. But with an audio, we can do something like that. Steve woke up in this morning and went to the store. Right? Neutral. Or Steve woke up this morning and he went to the store. Right? Totally different emotional conveyance. Exact same line on the page. So we, we talk at EA about how the art of audio fiction is the pairing of a pro of a text and a narrator. Right? And there are, there are lots of different ways that you can narrate audio text. I mean, audio books have what's called straight style reading and we've heard lots of it. It's a little bit south of a news presentation or, or an advertisement, but it's designed to be, it strives more towards that neutrality of position. You know, it, it gives kind of a straight read. But with when we start to lean towards things like audio drama or, you know, fully produced audio, you're laying, you're taking arthurial to, intent and to some extent maybe even editorializing on top because you know you are making artistic choices about how to present this prose what voice am i going to pair it with you know most care most stories tend to have main characters if they have more than one are we using multiple voices are we using one voice and which voice do we pick you know, where do we choose to add sound? Where do we choose to use silence? You know, you're making a whole nother layer kind of, of artistic choices on top of that. When we talk about like the strengths of, of writing for audio, like what makes a good story that makes a good audio story. I used to say that, you know, I would give that example I gave before about how people don't stop listening to audio when they get bored. And so we have to have a very, you know, high angle of attack kind of a story with a good, consistent, engaging sort of motion to it. But we also know that that kind of decision making is exclusive and, you know, it kind of limits the types of traditions that get honored in audio storytelling. So, so now when I think about that question, the way I answer it is, Whatever decision you make about the type of story you want to convey, what's really important, more so than it is in prose, is setting the expectation of what your listener, your, you know, your audience, is going to receive. Because if, if you present it, and, and that, that it spreads to all sorts of choices. What artwork do you use? what how you know how visually do you present the text if you do at all um what music do you choose what effects do you choose what voices do you choose you know how you package that and how you set that audience's expectation about what that's going to be meeting that expectation is almost as important as the story itself because if your audience comes into a two-hour piece of audio fiction knowing because the colors are pastel for example or the music is very slow and quiet. They know they're set up to expect a story that isn't gonna have a high angle of attack, that might be using a different narrative form. You know, it may have different elements of it that convey that expectation. You gotta meet that expectation. But if you don't do that, I think lots of audiences kind of make this assumption that the form of audio fiction is great opening line, lots and lots of activity, one character, and then the ending goes, ta-da, because that's what we expect. You know, a strong start, lots of pace, strong finish. But I don't think we have to be limited by that. I just think we have to be conscious that there is a bias that's been taught towards that, and that when we counter that, when we do something different to that, we have to pay more attention to how we build and bring our audience along with the expectation of what we're actually going to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, continuing on that vein to the next question. So to make that setup to 
you know, craft the environment that the audience finds themselves in when listening to these narrative podcasts. What are y'all's favorite tools uh, for setting that tone and adding to the suspense or creating that serenity, uh, whether it's the kind of narration or soundscapes or sound effects or music or things that I haven't listed? What are y'all's favorite tools for that? While well, go in order, uh, just before I answer the question again, uh, when Jean Paul said about like the authors getting to read the stories, when we launched uh, as a view, we were in a live with our supporters because we have like a crowdfunding and we were like presenting to them the project beforehand. And then I think there were like four people who had published with us and then their stories was there were there. And we listened to one of them and then everybody starts to cry. It was like, really? And we were like, oh, my, okay, we are Brazilian. They don't need to do much to make us cry. But at the same time, it was so, it was like so unexpected and, and it was amazing. And, and so I think, uh, this is a strength also in the audio. I think you feel it like more deeply. Right? So the, the 1st story we heard, we listened was, a. Uh, very emotional historian, so it was really beautiful. Um, but the, about the tools, I think like uh, there are many tools that are I think are very interesting. I would like uh, say one of them uh, for us in Brazil, uh, but I think it applies to every place is that um, we have like many regions in Brazil, so we have many accents inside of Brazil as well as in the United States, etc. Um, and I think it's it gives like another level we are doing in Brazil. We are having a deep conversation about um, representation inside Brazil because we have like uh, we publish many stories about like Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo that are the main cities and the main states in Brazil. But there are like a lot of nice cultures in the northeast, in the north, uh, in the south. And so uh, when you bring like different accents and when I do, when I say that, I mean like people from these places doing the accent, of course, um, I mean, just talking as they talk, I think it's a really nice um, thing to set also these stories because we publish stories that are set in the Northwest. So we have like people from the nor Northwest uh, talking and it's really, really interesting. Uh, but I also love what uh, Margaret, you know, show us in real time about the, how you do the intonation and how you lead the person to expect something using the intonation. I think this is, this is really interesting. And sometimes if you're reading somebody, like you don't even need to have like, um, uh, music that's like things or something like that. If somebody just talk in a way you, you can, you sometimes realize you are like, you know, expecting your body is reacting. This is really interesting. You are like, oh my God, expecting something. Cause I think it's very, um, it's about instinct, right? We are, we, we're not thinking about that. We are, our body is reacting to. Uh, things and I think this is why also uh, horror have this special, you know, like niche inside this this area. So I think this these are just like some of tools, but uh, some tools, but I think they are uh, very powerful tools. So <clears throat> there are so many fun tools to use in audio production. It's kind of endless, which makes this a really fun job. Um, I find which tool to reach for, though, really, really depends on the story. Um, you know, is it an action story? Is it something that's more introspective? Uh, that's going to change um, what devices we pull out. My, my secret weapons are my team of composers, uh, Red, Blue, Black, Silver, Fog Machine, Field Collapse. Um, they have, we've been working together since the beginning. We just had our four year anniversary and they each have strengths. So I know which story to give to who. Um, and oftentimes we'll discuss, you know, are we going to do Foley? Are we doing sound effects in this one? Are we going straight music for the background? Or are we going to do scout soundscapes and use field recordings? Um, so that all depends on the type of environment that we want the story to take place in, or, or that's the setting that's written into the story. Um, and the author will guide us to what tools that we're going to use. Um, and 
my probably my favorite the funnest is when i get to do aliens alien voices um some of the tools you know i've got here the roland vt4 this is one of my favorites for doing alien voices um you know we use a lot of hardware uh and software so it depends but um i love working with non-human characters doing robots alien voices those are my absolute favorites uh those are the ones where you get to get really creative and it's always interesting trying to find the balance between um legibility, you know, can you understand what we're saying and to try and make it uh, as foreign as possible. And um, the voice actors that come in, you know, I do a lot of the narration just out of practicality because I'm here in the studio. Um, if you show up at my house uh, and I'm working on a production, I'm likely to drag you in and and hopefully guide you through being a voice actor for the first time, which is a lot of fun because, uh, as I was saying earlier, this is an interpretive art. So um, it's great to bring in a variety of perspectives on that. Uh, and and hopefully bring that to life in different ways because we're all going to treat different characters and their dialogue differently. And of course, everybody speaks differently. So um, to bring that in as much as possible. But as far as the tools go, um, I mean, I could carry on and geek out about gear all day, uh, but it's really just what's appropriate for the story um, and and getting that author intent clear uh, and as, as close to what the author intended as possible. And that can sometimes mean to not use certain tools. Um, sometimes we'll we'll do some unconventional things. We will sometimes use binaural beats mixed in with the music since most people are listening on headphones. And those don't necessarily work on everybody, but you can guide someone's attention level a little bit with that um, or ramp up the excitement that way. So there's you want to some... maybe explain what those are for people who don't know. Sure. Um, a binaural beat or an isochronic tone, which can be used if you're not using headphones, is a difference in frequency from one ear to the other. So if you have an A, 440 hertz in one ear, and you have 447 in the other, your corpus callosum will actually synthesize the 7 hertz difference. And um, that you can... Basically, it's called entrainment, and you can sort of guide someone into a particular brainwave state. Um, you know, there are some irresponsible uses of this, you know, you don't want to get into epileptic territory and and cause somebody problems. Um, that's more likely to happen with light flicker. But if you're using binaural beats, it can be done wrong. So, for instance, when we're learning our attention level, we tend to be in an alpha brainwave state and you can guide someone through the, the audio experience into that. It takes a while to happen. So um, you, you have to gradually go into it. It's not something you can just throw in for three seconds and it'll work. Um, but there are some unconventional tools that can be thrown into the mix that can make it kind of fun and um, psychoacoustic effects, you know, if you want to go further into that, where you basically, like an optical illusion, you can um, synthesize sounds in someone's mind that aren't actually in the music. And and that's really neat to play with. Um, it's That's a, deep, a deeper topic that, that requires some experience and some practice to do, but that, that can be really fun too. So there's a lot of tools in the toolbox to, to make the stories come to life that, that can That's be some deep stuff. But I, I'm really glad that you got into like the technical aspects of it. So like, here's something that probably maybe doesn't, everybody in the conversation doesn't know, is that human hearing is at a very specific range. And there's there's a lot of sound that exists outside of the human range. I mean, we all know the example of like dogs and high pitches and whistles. But when you're an audio engineer, that is right territory, right? Because you can do things that will invoke emotional or mental responses that aren't consciously perceived by the person listening to the audio. So you can do things like, I mean, have you ever been to like a movie theater or, or a cinema where there's that really deep bass that you don't hear so much as feel and it's it causes that sensation of sort of uh oh uh oh am i supposed to run i don't know what's going on you know you can play with things like that in sound you can add those sorts of layers in a way that just completely bypasses like the conscious experience perhaps of the story that's being read um i i also like that you talked about having effects for things like non-human characters like robots and aliens and things like that and i think one of the the like trends that we've noticed because podcasts have become popular and wide stream it's there are so many more people who are experimenting and joining voice acting and because of that because the internet has made 
areas of the world more accessible than they were in the past. We've really, in audio fiction in particular, moved away from the idea of affectation, of putting on an accent, because we have access now to so much more of the world. If I need a native speaker of a language, the odds are so much better that I can find a skilled performer of a natively spoken language than I can if, I mean, we've all seen Yosemite Sam and, you know, bad Scottish accents and the whole nine yards. They, I mean, they, they have their place and when they, but these days when they're used, they're more for comedic effect than they are for their, you know, attempts to, to duplicate the authenticity because we have access now and I think that's really wonderful and it's really powerful to hear someone speak I mean authors talk about this a lot when you get that pairing right when you have a story by for example a Golagochi woman speaking and you get a Golagochi speaker to, to come in you know someone from that tradition to speak the words in the way that that person would speak the words that has an impact in a way that nothing else will have and it's time consuming and it's difficult and it can blow gigantic holes in your production schedule, but it also produces a product that just can't be duplicated in any other way, which I think is really good. Um, the other thing I would say is this, it sounds really intimidating, doesn't it? Audio fiction. It's like, oh my gosh, there's this thing and then there's this wizardry that happens and then it happens. The dirty secret is that it doesn't take a lot of technical skill to do this. It takes a tremendous amount of technical skill to do it really well. But if you just want to do it, if you want to learn it, if you want to have fun, if you want to leave the best voicemail messages you have ever left in your life, just do it. Most phones these days have good enough microphones that you can, re you can record pretty good quality audio. Freesounds.org will become your friend. It is a gigantic repository of people recording environments and effects and sounds and compositions. I mean, I can't remember his name. It's Kevin and it ends in something. There's this fantastic composer on YouTube who makes gigantic repositories of free to use music available. Tools and, and the components of putting together audio fiction are accessible in a way that they've never been before. So if you've ever like had the itch to try this, do it. I did. Uh, I have access to my partner is the voice actor of a famous villain from the Magnus Archives. He lives in my house and I have a phone and every once in a while I make him say ridiculous things into the phone and then I spend an hour on free sounds and I make these stupid little audio dramas in fandom communities and they're really fun and they're a great way to learn how to look at a waveform. If you're an author, chances are good that at some point in your career you're going to be at a convention, you're going to have a speaking opportunity where you get to give a reading listening to audio drama and practicing how to speak and how to give an audio presentation is one of the best editorial tools you will ever have at your disposal. I always recommend to anybody who's gonna, who wants to sell a piece of fiction into an audio market, have you read it out loud yourself? Because if you haven't read it out loud yourself, do you, 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 it's going to land in different ways. Also, your copy editor will thank you because you will miss every, dropped word that you swore was there but that isn't or realize that that actually is a paragraph that is one entire sentence and there's no place to breathe in the middle of it it's a beautiful editorial tool that and it really is more accessible to everybody than than they think they are and it's so much fun it will eat as much time as you will give it but it's really really fun absolutely agreed um if you have a phone, you have Pro Tools free or Audacity, you can mess around with all kinds of sounds. That's exactly what I did when I bumbled around and got sucked into the very deep hole that is audio drama community. Um, and, and then you wake up like three weeks later and your phone's out of storage and there's all these files you can't identify on your computer. It's, it's the most yes. wonderful type of rabbit hole. 
Yep, and then you learn to store web files in Google Drive instead of your <laughs> local <laughs> desktop very quickly. Um, Can I yes, add something I... to that real quick? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. For those interested in getting into podcasting, you know, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole of gear of you can spend millions of dollars and still not have enough. Um, you can do this for free. Um, as long as you have a computer, uh, there are tons of free tools out there. Um, there's tons of free classes to learn how to do editing. Uh, most of the software you need is free. Uh, it need not be expensive or intimidating. Um, you know, at some point you might want to upgrade. I'm still using a hundred dollar mic that I bought 20 years ago. Um, you know, it, it can be done for free. So don't let the gear element um, turn you off to getting into podcasting because it, it can be done for nothing. It can it can be done for low cost. I would just just clarify nothing can can give you the time that you might not have to do it. And there are barriers to participation in this form. You know, yes, equipment is is it can be cheap. And yes, a lot of the software can be free, but if you're not in a position in your life where you have spare time or you have high speed internet connectivity, th there can be barriers to participation. So I know we talk a lot about how the internet is the great levelizer, but it's not for everything. If that's your situation, if you really want to do this, but you're lacking some component, find friends. Nothing makes this more fun, more fun than finding friends to collaborate with, because then you have you have sounding boards or you have sound boards. Some of them have sound boards and, and you can you can make up for, you know, what you perceive as perhaps a lack of access or opportunity or equipment by contributing what you can contribute and then collaborating with another group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and asking questions to people who you meet at this conference who will say, no, 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 don't buy this thing first, just do this. <laughs> and that will save a lot of time and money. <laughs> Uh, so continuing like, along that vein, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I'm so sorry. Most libraries or a lot of libraries these days have podcast recording equipment that you can check out or have studios. They have recording spaces that you can use for whatever the cost to you of your library usage is. So th there is a lot of community equipment and audio drama and audio fiction as a community is young. It's not the youngest kind of emerging art form these days. That that's probably TikTok, and I could spend an hour talking about the emergent art form that is TikTok. But what what it has decided, kind of as a community, is that it is a community, and there aren't. I mean, there are always in any market and any niche of creativity being involved. There are people who succeed more than others. But what this market has done as a group is decided, yes, there are going to be those folks who get vaulted. You know, there are going to be the night veils. But the rest of us, we are much more invested in the success and the development of our peers than we are in throwing anybody under the bus to get a slightly higher chance of being the next one who succeeds. So finding community in audio is one of the easiest experiences I have ever had in entering a new art form. They are so welcoming and so enthusiastic and they will definitely share their knowledge and they love to share their squee and they love to create fan art, which I freaking adore. Um, there, there are people there who in this world, it, probably at this convention, who love the thing you do, probably the way you love it and who would love to team up with you and do something. Just. Try and find them, and then they will help you. Absolutely agreed. Um, and I can attest to that as well. I was absolutely overwhelmed by the people that I met in the audio drama community. It is not hard to make those really strong friendships um, and collaborations. So another question kind of continuing along that vein is, I mean, people might be intimidated I mean, of course, there's going to be challenges um, to making narrative podcasts. What are some of the challenges that y'all have uh, with making these shows? And what's some advice that y'all can give? I think this one is hard for me to answer because I'm in a very different context. Like, the audience is 
different, the market is different. So I'm here to hear, to listen to your advices. Um, but I think that like one of the, I think the main challenge is like, but now it's changing is exactly like when I started, I didn't know where I would like update my files. How can I do to, you know, publish something in audio? Now things are much easier. You can, you know, Google and you find a way to send your audio to Anchor Pot uh, and Spotify and whatever. But in the beginning, it was something like that I was really, what do I do? And when I do, did my uh, the podcast about my book, I put it like in my website, you know, so I just started in my website and just had like a player, a really sim simple player there. Uh, but, but as I said, like, it's much easier to, to know, to find um, more data where to, how to do that. And also if you have a community, you can ask and, and all that. But as I said, like, I want you to listen to all the tips because I'm like, now, now is my time to make notes. <laughs> I find the most challenging aspect of of podcasting and and doing audio fiction is the amount of time that it takes. It's uh, it, it's an incredibly time consuming endeavor. And um, I I had a friend over recently when I was doing some narration, and um, they were the, under the impression that uh, I was a flawless reader that I could read a story start to finish perfectly, which is completely untrue. Uh, in a fifteen minute story, I will often edit out half an hour worth of mistakes, flubbed lines, and so forth. Um, that takes a lot of time, but that's putting the time into it is what really makes it great. And, uh, I think for those trying to get into it, don't be intimidated by those mistakes. No matter how good the production sounds to you, it was filled with mistakes before the audio editor got in there and, and really cleaned it up. And that's the most time consuming part of the process. Uh, it will take me hours to edit a 15 minute story. Um, to get out the breathing noises, to get out background noises, to um, fix my flubbed lines or my mispronunciations. I'm one of those people that learned my vocabulary from reading. I tend to mispronounce things, and uh, it's amazing how much I learn. Um, uh, in doing fantasy stories, you know, I have to ask for pronunciation sheets often because I don't know how to say this correctly, and I don't want to say it multiple ways and and throw off the listener. So. Um, it's the amount of time that it takes, but it, the time is worth it because the end product is rewarding and no one's going to know how many hours you spent pulling your hair out trying to to do the editing. And that's a, usually a very solo alone process, but it, it's worth it. And um, we all make those mistakes. It's just a matter of removing them later, just like in writing a story and needing to edit it afterwards. Yeah, I would definitely echo the sentiment that time is like the number one problem. Like maybe some metrics might be useful. If you're a good audio editor, expect to spend three times as much time editing the audio as the raw record. And that's if you're good. If you're not good, if you're, you know, you're just learning or if you are producing a very high quality product, multiply that even higher. And then like, the metric for audio drama. So we're talking about things like, you know, night veil, full, full sound, everything. Uh, the estimate is one hour per minute of produced audio. So a 40 minute episode takes at least 40 hours to produce. And that's the sound. That's not the three time multiplier you spent previously on the dialogue. That's just the sound. So time is a, is the huge gate of of audio drama, and that that's why collaboration with a team can be really important. If you have multiple people able to to take different tasks or to chain together periods of time where people are working on different elements of it, it can be it can sometimes make the difference between a final product and not because. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't have a spare 40 hours a week. I mean, if somebody would like to pay me the spare 40 hours a week, I take payment in time. That would be brilliant. Other other frustrations. Um, people thinking that they can't do it. You know, people just having the expectation that this is something that television studios produce or here in the UK, you know, the BBC does audio drama. I can't do audio drama. You can absolutely do audio drama. You can do it just like you can write. Whether 
it produces what you envisioned in your head. Only you can answer and why would you expect that to be perfect out of the gate? I mean, it's a skill like anything else. It requires practice and iteration and exposure. I mean, just like with reading, if you're not reading tons and tons and stuff, you're not going to write really well. Are you listening to tons and tons of audio drama? Then how are you going to, how can you expect yourself to produce it in the way that you want to? So, yeah. Really great points, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, we're at the 50 minute mark. So I think y'all can give some like closing remarks or say where to find your work or social media, uh, but then we'll wrap up. I want to thank Marguerite and Jean Paul. It was like amazing panel for me. I was, I, I wish I had like an, a notebook to make notes. Um, so thank you. It was amazing. <laughs> yes, I should have. Like, I was making too. notes. Not mine. Yeah, you, you can listen to it later. Yeah, yeah, I, I will do that. I will do that. And if somebody wants to find me, I'm very active in Twitter. I will leave my handle here in the chat, but it's Jana P. Bianchi. And, and that's it. I talk about, I, I mainly tweet in Portuguese, but sometimes I tweet in English too. And there's the translation too. So, <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Uh, you can find our podcast simultaneous times pretty much anywhere podcasts are available. Um, there's also a band camp where you can find some other recordings from our live events, some free poetry audio books we put together that have music. Um, and on spacecowboybooks.com, we also do simultaneous times newsletter where we interview authors, editors, and just people in the field of SF and F. Um, I, I do want to throw it out there. There's a contact form on my website, spacecowboybooks.com. If you have questions about podcasting, if you're having technical difficulties, I will do my best to answer your questions. Feel free to hit me up and I will do what I can. Also, I've written a series of podcasting articles, which can be found on Dream Foundry's blog. Um, please check those out. If you have questions, feel free to hit me up. I'll do my best to walk you through it because, um, as we were talking about earlier, this is a community thing and uh, it can, there can be a learning curve, but there are people there to help you and, and I'm one of them. And more importantly, only you can create your work and we want to hear your work. So you have to create it so we can hear it. Um, I'm Marguerite Kenner. I'm Legal Valkyrie on Twitter. I'll put that into the chat. Um, you can also find me on Twitch with my partner, Alistair Stewart. Uh, we, we stream for EA twice a week. Uh, one night a week we do Fiction, we do audio fiction, or right now we're currently narrating a video game. Uh, it's called, um, it's called Scarlet Hollow. It's a beautiful game written by Black Tabby Games with uh, narrative creative choice, but none of the characters are voiced. So we're voicing all of them. Um, and then on uh, Sundays, we, we do some chill video gaming. Currently I'm playing Outer Wilds for the first time. And I've learned the very important rule that you must get to orbit before engaging the autopilot. It only took me three days to figure that out. Um, oh. You can find me on Twitter and I have one more session here at Flights of Foundry on Sunday morning, my time. That's hour 44, I believe. I have a chill and chat session and I think it still has capacity. So if you want to come talk about audio fiction or contracts or streaming or why She-Hulk is the best Marvel of hero we haven't had yet, uh, come and join me. Awesome. Jenna, Jean Paul, Marguerite, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the convention and please make sure to sleep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.